Hello. Today we're going to go over in the Reading or Eating Asian America book by Robert Koo, chapter eight, uh, as American as Jackrabbit Adobo, Cooking, Eating, and Becoming Filipina Old uh, American Before War II by Don Babylon, who is a wonderful Asian American scholar. As American as Jackrabbit, Adobo, Cooking, Eating, and Becoming Filipina American Before War II by Don Mabalon. Don uh, Mabalon died way too soon. She passed away. Uh, uh, she was born in 1972 and she passed away in 2018. Way too soon. A wonderful, dynamic scholar activist. She's an academic of Filipino history in Central Valley, born in Stockton. Her schooling is she went to San Joaquin Delta. She went to UCLA, got her master's, where she wrote her master's on Filipina pioneers. Her PhD was at Stanford, and she wrote about the life in Lilo Manila. So a wonderful, dynamic scholar. Now, Mabalon and, uh, is a co-founder of the Little Manila Foundation in order to preserve Little Manila in Stockton. Uh, she uh, formerly was a San Francisco State professor. She's associate professor in history, um, always in our heart forever. Her contribution to Asian America, particularly to Filipino American studies, is immeasurable, wonderful woman. Now, she wrote many books in her short life. She wrote Little Manila is in the Heart, probably based on her dissertation at Stanford. Um, highly recommend you get the book, The Making of Filipino American Community in Stockton, California. She also did a, a, a graphic kind of novel almost, uh, and it's called Journey for Justice, The Life of Larry Ilatong, written by Don Malabon, PhD. And also she wrote Filipinos in Stockton. So again, massively important scholar, gone too soon. Now her chapter starts about her father, right? Now it's a really evocative beginning to the chapter. It's, and she talks about how her father, you know, she speaks about encouraging Filipino Americans to preserve their family histories with a goal of expanding historical narratives, not just to the Anglo American stories, but other stories such as Asian American stories or uh, Latino American stories or African American stories. Now she's Asian Americans and all ethnic, she, she argues that Asian Americans and all ethnic groups should preserve their family history and possibly donate them to an archive. So I encourage you to do oral history with your phone and of your parents and donate that to your local university or your local um, library. Now she talks about her, her father. His name was Ernesto Mabalon, and he arrives to the United States in 1963 in Stockton, California from the Philippines. Her Lolo, which is grandfather, ran the local Filipino Lafayette lunch counter in Stockton called Lilo Manila. Now he wanted so much to eat something from his traditional Philippines. He wanted his dry fish, which is toyo, and he cooked it, but it stunk up the entire restaurant. And there's a lot of um, chaos and confusion because of the smells. And, and so you see here, if anyone's heated, I'm not going to say what it is, but if you've eaten before on the one on the right, it's kind of a surprise at every egg. Uh, if, if you don't know what it is, uh, then you're going to have to search it out uh, and find a Filipino friend to tell you what what is this uh, thing in a kind of like a mystery surprise? Now, have you ever eaten fruit, food that other people thought was stinky or strange? Now, here on the left, we have a duran. They call it the king of the fruit. I have to say it is illegal to actually uh, take this in, sun, in, in airplanes in Southeast Asia, as well as bringing this on the train in Southeast Asia. I think Singapore in particular, you cannot bring on the train. It just smells the entire place up. But people say it's very refreshing. The middle, of course, is stinky tofu, which again, isn't a choir taste, um, particularly people love them from Taiwan. And of course, the right, the right is actually a balut. It is kind of like a fetus inside a egg. And it's kind of like a mystery in every single time because sometimes the eyeball shows, sometimes no eyeball, sometimes the legs are you know, come out. Sometimes they don't. It's kind of mystery. <laughs> and I, I always have my wonderful Filipino students tell us like these stories where they ate it and they love it or they hate it. It's always wonderful stories. 
Now her father, you know, wanted this fish so bad, you know, the stinky fish and he made it and he made the, the entire restaurant smell. Right. And then he was chastised and all the, all the uh, restaurant patrons like, Oh, this the smell, the smell. And so again, you know, for, for Dawn's father, the Tuyu was a powerful symbol of culture, of class and identity, and even of the provinces, right? The province that you're from, you know how food and smells brings home uh, a, a memory of where you're from. And he really wanted this dry fish, which is where his province is from and what people in his province eat. Now his, his father, he swore he'd always eat it despite what other people thought was quote, too good, right? For rice and fish, right? Because some people are like, oh no, we're in America now. No, no, we eat like hamburgers. No, he's like, I want to have my traditional province uh, food, which is fish. Now, 150,000 Filipinos had migrated to the USA before World War II, okay? And they were despised and come somewhat made to be embarrassed of their food and their youth, right? So for instance, if they had fish or, you know, various Asian um, smelly items uh, for food, you know, people would embarrass them. And so they were kind of dissuaded from eating their natural food. So they kind of ate the food around them in every place, okay? So Dawn's historian question is, and this is a question that as a historian she's asking, well, if they were dissuaded from eating their kind of like their own natural delicious food that they wanted to eat, like, you know, dried fish, what did they eat then? And how did American colonialism transform the Filipino American diet in the United States? What role did gender and class play in the production and consumption? What recipe survived the journey and or transformed? And how did the cannery or farming transform the way it was cooked? Okay. So in her chapter, this is what she asks. And now she's going to answer them. Well, what did they eat? Well, a lot of Filipino people open Chinese restaurants, and they open, they're kind of chop sweet houses, and it it kind of in a way it it um they opened them, but they also went to Chinese restaurants, and it became quote a way to become Americanized, right? So even for other Asians, going to American Chinese restaurant, you know, they became like a chop sweet house, made the American. Other groups did this too as well. African Americans, most notable is Jewish Americans. You know, they go to Chinese restaurants all the time, particularly for their Christmas. Um, our Christmas they. Go Go. And um, very famous, uh, I think, Supreme Court Justice Keegan, when she was like being um, interrogated for a nomination, they asked you, where were you during Christmas? And she's like, well, like most Jews, I was at a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> so again, these Filipinos, like Jewish uh, Americans, went to chop suey houses to feel American. Now they discarded with parts that they actually used discarded parts that butchers and, and uh, fishmongers and grocers didn't want. And they made delicious meals of, uh, you know, they got free pig's heads, tripe, bellies, tails, feet. And anyone knows who eats Asian or Latino entrees or African-American traditional entrees, you know, these are delicious. They're really, really delicious. They, they change into, you know, delightful food. Also, they, what do they eat? They ate veggies. They ate a lot of veggies and they ate corn food, canned foods like corned beef. Yes. Um, and I'll, I highly recommend uh, you try Filipino chicken adobo or pork adobo. Yeah, try it. There's wonderful places all over America. But, you know, if you're in Fresno, there's a wonderful place called Jollibee's. Uh, uh, Jollibee's and then uh, there's a chain store called Jollibee's all over the United States and really delicious. Try that. Hollow, hollow and try that pork adobo, uh, you will not be disappointed. So Filipinos or Filipino X, depends on what you want to say. Um, I know there's like lots of debate now are, are we Latinos or Latino X? Okay, so uh, you know, they ate a lot of things that, um, you know, traditionally are not in the Philippines. Spam, for one, it's controversial. And also corned beef. These are not things that, you know, they ever ate in, in the Philippines, but in the United States, they were cheap, plentiful, probably not healthy, but lots of salt in there, but that's what they ate. Also, how did the cannery or farming transform the way they cooked? Remember, a lot of Filipinos were scattered all over the United States. Some were working in Stockton as an agriculture workers. Some, you know, uh, remember uh, they, uh, Larry Ilatong, he was one of the original farm workers who actually protested, right? And people don't remember that he actually involved Cesar Chavez in his, in his movement. And again, you know, they became the farm workers movement, but of course, because Larry Ilatong, no one remembers, you know, what he did, right? 
So after the war, many Filipinos joined the army and transformed the food, right? Thinking corned beef and cans and spam. And also what they ate, remember Filipinos were also immigrated to Alaska as well. So they had seal adobo, they had uh, salmon, a singlong, and you know, that's just, you know, making it with noodles and adobe is kind of like a barbecue sauce, right? So they adapted for American ingredients and now they made it Filipino American. So again, these are just great, delightful transformations, right? It's flavors they put to different items, but again, made it Filipino. How did American colonization transform the Filipino diet? What recipes survived the journey and were transformed? So the incarceration of, of Japanese Americans on the West Coast allowed Filipinos to take over empty stores and farms and Filipino uh, grocery stores flourished, adobo survived. So unfortunately, when the Japanese were incarcerated, they kind of left a lot of open farms and open stores open, but, and Filipinos went in and actually occupied those stores and farms and, and they actually flourished during that time. And during this time, adobo, which I highly recommend, is kind of like a like kind of a mix of, I would say Mexican barbecue sauce, maybe? It tastes delicious. So what role did gender and class play in the production and consumption? Well, young Filipinas with no elders around had to adapt to the new American ingredients. Different Filipinas from different parts of the Philippines fused all the food they had together. And mostly poor Filipinos came to the US. So what can we take away about this chapter, right? There's a lot of takeaways, right? Well, they adapted and they transformed their local ingredients. They found like seals, right? Or whatever animal that's not obviously not local to the Philippines, but they Filipinoized it by putting their flavors and their cooking techniques. And one, rice and adobo, that was a transformation. They ate vegetables. That's the transformation, U.S. vegetables. They saw American food as more hygienic. Um, again, they went to uh, Chinese uh, restaurants to feel more Americanized. They ate and baked chiffon cakes. They ate biscuits. Um, it was illegal for salmon fishing for drying later, but they did it. Okay, they ate seal adobo and they made it. They made ate seal and they made it adobo. They even had a bear and they nil a nil alaga. They they made the flavors and of it the bear to be Filipino flavors. Chop suey they ate um, to be more Americanized, right? And they used parts that the butchers discarded. And they also ate canned corned beef and spam. So again, Filipinos very much transformed by American foodways, but they also transformed American foodways. All right, so if you have any questions, feel free to email me.